Well, this is a view of the uh, of a tra tracking and data relay satellite in the bay. This is a, as it was moving up toward the final attitude. 45 degrees, you can see on our protractor, that was our minimum elevation angle. Once it got to 45, if everything else was okay, that thing was going, whether we got to 58 or not. Now, that's the nozzle of the solid rocket motor, and this is the instant of separation. As Don said, we really had to kind of check the television view from this aspect to see that it was, in fact, deployed. Absolutely perfect deployment mechanically. It came straight out of the ASC, the Airborne Support Equipment, with no rates, just that, uh, again, at it's four-tenths of a foot a second, which isn't all that fast. And now at about a minute after deploy, as we thrust backward toward it, and you're not sure the thing is really clear of the orbiter, but that does cause you to pitch down also or away from the thing. But it nevertheless, it gets its attention when you're thrusting back toward a 17 or 18 ton piece of metal in the sky. <coughs> this is the FCS flight control system checkout. We do it uh, every flight on the vehicle. That uh, is story operating the camera to take data for the uh, continuous flow electrophoresis system experiment. This is once a joint venture between McDonnell, Douglas, and Johnson and & Johnson, which they have every confidence is going to have direct earthborne application very shortly. He's, uh, he was taking some photos of the, the streams up there and down here. He's uh, getting ready to change out some samples. Don was basically, uh, he was the housekeeper, and you can see that he kept a, a nice, neat ship down here. You know, there's not a lot of trash and equipment and items hanging on the uh, lockers and on the bulkhead and and that really helped a lot and this was flight day two here while uh, Bo was telling the world about the uh, getaway specials they were mounted in those three canisters we did a antenna test which necessitated us getting crossways to our velocity vector and then rolling at two degrees a second we took some pictures of it, and I tell you, it was a little more impressive from on board than it is here. But nevertheless, it was a, a welcome diversion from just going around the world with a payload bay facing the earth all the time. This was on EVA day. That's uh, Story and Don in the airlock, beginning their pre-breathe. You know, it requires three and a half hours of pre-breathe on 100% oxygen to make sure or to have better assurances that we've flushed nitrogen out of the system so folks don't get the bends when they're exposed to the lower pressures in the suit. And this is story like a, uh, a butterfly coming out of its chrysalis. I'll discuss the uh, extra vehicle activity or the spacewalk. The thing we wanted to test and evaluate there was our ability to do construction type work, repair type work, in the environment of the, uh, the shuttle orbiter. We wanted to check out our suits and the life support systems on the back that we call EMUs. We wanted to evaluate how we check them out before we take them into the airlock and depress and take them outside. We did have three suits on board. We wanted to look at our ability to move about in the payload bay, up and down the longerons or up and down the long distance of the payload bay, and across the bulkheads fore and aft. We want to look at our safety tether dynamics, the safety tether we wear to be sure that we stay connected uh, to the orbiter. We want to exercise various tools, winches, and in summary, <clears throat> our basic ability to do work, constructive type work or repair type work in the environment of the orbiter. Don here is back at the IUS tilt table. This is in the aft end. He's using a ratchet wrench here to uh, reposition some equipment. The story mentioned before, their, their practice run through of the IUS tilt table restow mechanism for which we have uh, an EVA procedure. That's just kind of a gee whiz thing. I tell you, this, this thing really does have a, 
a Star Wars effect. 65 feet is a long way back, and it's a big vehicle, and it's still surprising. You look back, you're in orbit, you're in a spacecraft, and a damn thing has got wings and a tail. It just it seems innocuous. And, and when those guys were in the back end of the vehicle, they were far enough away, and, and everything just absolutely silent. You know, you're gliding over the Earth uh, due to some some fortunate magic, and, and they're back there having a heck of a good time in this case, and uh, it, it really does have, it's more Star Warsy than Star Wars, I think. This is, as we were going down, we were fortunate here, that's the west coast of Mexico, just below Guadalajara, where it kind of bends from the southeast to the east-southeast, so we were zinging right along the Mexican coast, which has no significance, except I think it makes for a nicer looking picture than if you had nothing down there. You notice on the fin, the rudder is offset to the left a little bit up there. That kind of surprised me. It turns out, in talking to folks afterward, that the flight control system checkout leaves the rudder parked to the left. And uh, it's nothing to be concerned about. That's just what it does. Now, those are all daylight scenes. Here are some with the, with the, uh, the film compensates for the, the lack of overall illumination in the, in the cargo bay. I think Story mentioned that... Uh, the helmet-mounted lights were, for all practical purposes, essential, and at the payload bay, flood lighting was not adequate to do your tasks. Story here is using the uh, EVA winch that uh, is utilized for several different tasks. This is on the Ford bulkhead, and it's routed down to. He just pointed to an extra genie down there, which is used only, which is used only a load on the uh, on the line that we use. Here we're doing some suit mobility checks, kind of uh, uh, reach envelope determination, suit stability and mobility evaluation, seeing if there were any objectionable uh, lockups in the uh, in any of the the bearings. This is getting back into the airlock. Turns out we have a little work to do on uh, the term story used is choreographing this evolution, and that, that's a very good term, I think. This is on the last day of the flight when we had our impromptu uh, conversation with the vice president. And we decided we were uh, notified during the flight that we had the dubious distinction of, uh, of being the an average age, the oldest crew to ever fly, anytime, anywhere. <laughs> These were taken from the TV photo chase on return to Edwards. You can see the weather was as good out there for entry as it was at, uh, in Florida for the launch. This is through the HUD, through the head-up display. The HUD was a tremendous asset, I feel, toward making what subjectively, from, uh, from the operator's point of view, what, that I thought was a, a relatively smooth approach and landing. Here we are in a flare. Preparation for landing. This almost counts as a carrier landing, as you'll see in the next photo, by an overwater approach here. <laughs> Edward Dry Lake Bay. Right. Uh, we felt a little turbulence, one gust on final, on the final approach, and it just sailed right through it with, with no crew response necessary. Uh, the touchdown was nominal. Uh, from my standpoint, anyway, relatively smooth. I didn't hear any gasps, so you guys might all have been holding your breath or something. Speed brakes are starting open. Our standard procedure, as soon as the main gear are on deck, I call speed brakes open, and Bo manually opens the speed brakes to help impart some drag to it. <coughs> but anyway, it, it's starting to come together, folks. The whole system is... Uh, I, we're on our way. It did feel good to be back on the ground again, even though it was a tremendously exhilarating experience. But that is just such a, a huge, impressive vehicle, especially when it's sitting on the ground. 